Well, let's get started. Um, this is the sixth in our Breadfruit People uh, webinar series. And it's really an extraordinary session today with speakers from um, the Caribbean sharing the Caribbean experience of breadfruit. Um, I'd like to invite um, uh, Megan Lealoha Ao to just open us up and set our intentions uh, for a, uh, a valuable experience with an opening pule, as we say in Hawaii, an opening blessing. Mahalo pule kako. Ke kua, dear creator, mahalo for this gathering, mahalo for the people worldwide who have come here to listen in and connect and learn from our family and community in the Caribbean. We're so grateful for all of their research and all of their hearts and hands that go into the inspiration that comes into their, their, um, their most honed in research and the ways that they are able to communicate and share this information and allow it to be transferred into their communities through this life-giving food for all of us to understand and learn more about our connections and how our communities are meant to grow and heal together. We ask that you give them the divine inspiration in these presentations and the openness of heart and, and mind of our attendees so that we may all in this in this moment and for all of our movements forward be in this this state of connection through this life giving food. Mahalo for all of these things. We are so grateful. Amen. Thank you. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today um, in this rather extraordinary session. And I had the the honor of attending. Um, um, Dr. Nekrumah's uh, International Breadfruit Conference in 2015, where my eyes were just open to this incredible parallel universe happening with all the same kinds of uh, topics being researched, products being developed, and connectivity to breadfruit being reestablished, revitalized in so many different ways. So that was eye-opening for me. And um, I think perhaps everyone speaking today um, uh, from the Caribbean was present at that conference, which was really quite extraordinary in itself. So we have um, six presenters today. And so we have a really full plate for our 90 minute session. I would like to um, invite you to, uh, uh, as, as the presenters are speaking, you can enter any questions you have as they come to your mind in the Q&A box. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a, it says Q&A. It's a question and answer box um, where you can type in your questions and presenters will answer them either in text in that box or we will handle them verbally, time allowing at, after all presenters have completed their presentations. So um, the webinar is being recorded as you have noticed when you joined and it will be made available uh, on the Breadfruit People website, which is at breadfruitpeople.com. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that the, the Breadfruit, this series of Breadfruit webinars is um, funded through the Farmers Organizations for Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific program, which I believe um, uh, uh, is the logo uh, right behind Kyle there. And so we're very grateful that they have made this possible. Um, for, for all of us to enjoy and learn from. Our first presenter uh, is uh, actually in Belgium and um, it is Yvonne Sembe Sheleche and she is an expert in commodities and value chains development. She is with the um, Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. And we are so pleased to have her here with us we know it's late, late night in Belgium right now. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to, um, to listening to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, Aloha, Bula. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I was just saying, I was uh, passing my greetings, Aloha. Bola, good morning and good evening to you all. Uh, let me take this opportunity to first and foremost uh, welcome everybody to the second series of the Breadfruit People webinars, which I understand uh, will be running from October to December. 
um, and as mentioned, with the support of the Farmers Organization for Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States program. Um, and this is a program which is a joint initiative uh, between my organization, the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States and the EU. Um, before I turn to the slides, I just wanted to also take this opportunity to thank PIFON for inviting us to give uh, these opening remarks at this very important event. I also want to take, um, um, I also want to recognize the presence of the various key partners who are on the call that have actually made this event possible. And a big thank you to all the speakers for accepting the invitation to participate in this webinar. I have been, uh, I was informed uh, by colleagues that um, the first series of the webinar uh, on breadfruit that ran this year actually attracted a lot of um, widespread interest and significant amount of this interest came from the Caribbean region. And that's the reason that uh, we, we are meeting today. And uh, this session is basically dedicated to specific um, uh, discussions on breadfruit activities in the Caribbean. Um, today, therefore, uh, we will explore, from my understanding, an exchange on how breadfruit can contribute to uh, boosting domestic food production, especially as farmers are trying to adapt to the challenges of COVID-19, uh, the climate change, uh, climate change challenges, and food security. Now, from the policy side, we do recognize that breadfruit continues to have a huge positive socioeconomic impact on OSCPS countries. It has been recognized as the most significant food crop of the 21st century because of uh, the great nutritional benefits, social and financial positive impacts it has on economies. So I'm very positive that um, today's discussions will which will dive deep into health and nutrition, propagation and value addition to mention but a few in the, uh, in the bread uh, fruit sector who contribute to the wealth of knowledge and play a critical role in shaping the future of policies in this area. Now, for some of you that may not be familiar with the OSCPS uh, organization, I prepared about four slides just to uh, shed some light on what we do as an organization. Could we please move to the next slide? Yes, so um, the OACPS basically is the organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States. Um, it became an international organization in April, 2020 and evolved from the ACP group founded uh, through the Georgetown Agreement in 1975. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the name ACP group because this, is, this has been our name for some time until last year. We are composed of 79 states from Africa, Caribbean and Pacific regions, which of course include breadfruit producing countries. 70% of our member states are commodity dependent and as such derive at least 60% of their export earnings from commodity exports. Therefore, what we try to do is to promote the sustainable development of our member states and their gradual integration into the global economy with the ultimate objective of reducing and eventually eradicating poverty. As earlier mentioned, we are based in Brussels. Our organization is headed by Secretary General, uh, His Excellency, Mr. George Rebello Pinto Chicotti. Next slide, please. So what I've done is um, on this slide, I basically just highlighted um, two initiatives, which I thought are important to mention, especially as we will be discussing uh, various aspects of the breadfruit uh, sector. And um, these two initiatives, I basically wanted to highlight what we are doing in terms of supporting our member states to enhance value addition and also facilitate market access. So the first initiative I wanted to uh, share information with you on is what we call the Joint ACP-EU Cooperation Framework for Private Sector Development, which was adopted in 2014. This is the framework that actually uh, guides the implementation of the joint um, OACP 
OSCPS EU programs, which we're, which we're implementing to promote private sector development. Another initiative which I thought was important for the discussions today relates to what we call the ACP new approach on support for the development of agriculture value chains, which was actually adopted in 2017. And the aim of this uh, approach is basically to empower actors along the value chain, um, such as more water farmers, women, youth, and all different players. Now, from these two initiatives, five areas were identified as being critical if we're going to talk about value addition or even uh, enhanced market access. Um, these um, areas which we identify include finance, uh, that is facilitating access to finance, capacity building, trade and investment, climate change, and knowledge management. Could we please move to the next slide? Now, on this slide, I have given you just a few examples of some of the intra ACP programs which we are jointly implementing with, um, uh, with the EU. And um, I've also highlighted um, the links where you can actually get additional information. So the first program which is highlighted here is the farm organization for the ACP program. Uh, in short, we call it for. Um, it has a budget of about 40 million euros, and um, we recently topped it up, topped up the budget by 10 million euros. This is a program that is actually supporting the hosting of these different webinars that we're going to have over the next few months. Then the second uh, program, which basically uh, was designed to address the challenges of access to finance, is what we call Agri Business Capital Fund which has a budget of uh, 45 million um, uh, euros. This is a fund which we, we have seen a lot of uh, demand coming from Africa, because as I mentioned, we cover Africa, Pacific and the Caribbean. We haven't seen so many applications coming from the Caribbean, but we're hoping that uh, the momentum we, will, will improve. We did have um, an, a, an information session to just share information on uh, how this uh, funds can be accessed under this facility. Then the third uh, program is the Fit for Market program, which basically looks at uh, building capacities for our member states to be able to uh, comply with market access uh, regulations like under the EU. And then we are now working on what we're calling the framework program on agriculture value chains, which has a budget of 154 million. But basically, this uh, program has got three areas, um, capacity building, uh, finance, and the third component looks at uh, COVID-19 response uh, activities. I have included a link at the bottom there where if you click on it, you'll be able to actually get uh, additional information on the different programs that we are implementing to support the private sector development. And of course, um, breadfruit being a commodity, um, that is uh, um, um, produced, produced by one of our countries is an area that uh, is covered by these programs. Next slide, please. Now on this slide, what I was just trying to do is just zero in on um, the pharma organization uh, for ACP program, which is basically the program that uh, is supporting the webinar that we have today. And just to share some information with you. Um, so we are implementing this program uh, with, in collaboration with uh, IFAD. And IFAD is working with different uh, regional bodies from Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific. In the Pacific, uh, we are working closely with PIFON in the implementation of this program. In the Caribbean, we are working with four uh, organizations, that is FAO, uh, the regional office of FAO, uh, AgriCord, uh, Procasu, and then uh, we are also working with the Caribbean network of fair trade small producers and workers. And then in Africa, we are also working with an uh, organization called uh, Pan African Farmers Organization, which works with um, regional farmer organizations. Our expectations from uh, the implementation of this program, as we are observing today, is that, for instance, we expect that the program is going to facilitate knowledge sharing and peer learning 
like we are experiencing today. So we're very, very happy with that uh, output. We also expect that this program is going to facilitate access to finance and markets for the producers. We also expect that the program will contribute to increasing um, um, production and value addition for our farmers, and that the farmers through this program, from the capacity that will be built, they'll be able to influence uh, policy dialogue. Now, just to stress before I end uh, my presentation to say that through these programs, our aim is to support member states improve their productive capacities, value addition, and integrate into regional and global markets. We certainly want to see this for the breadfruit sector. And in this regard, I wish to renew our commitment to working closely with PFON and all the partners around in the core in supporting the breadfruit sector. Through this series of webinars, we are positive that the network of breadfruit practitioners will grow and continue to build new partnerships around this important crop. We hope that in the near future, we could also have a similar conversation with colleagues from Africa, maybe have speakers from the three regions ex exchange in a similar fashion. And one thing that we have noted, noted is that the pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerability of our commodity dependent countries and demonstrated the importance of close collaboration and networking among countries and producers in OSCPS regions. And for this, that is why we're very happy that PFON has actually organized with the different partners to host this uh, webinars. Please be rest assured that we stand with you and will continue to be your partner in the recovery period ahead. With these remarks, I wish you a fruitful and productive meeting. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Yvonne. And it's so heartening to know that you're working on those things. Um, really eye-opening. So thank you. So we'll move to our um, next speaker, um, Dr. Laura roberts Nakuma, And um, I, I met her first at the 2015 International Breadfruit Conference in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, uh, Dr. Nekuma is a professor of crop science and, and a pioneer in her field. And from here, um, it seems that she is dedicated tirelessly to uh, advancing breadfruit, uh, especially as a sustainable crop that can be developed into um, innovative products, value-added products that benefit local communities and um, and also um, uh, benefit local agricultural economies. So um, with that, I, uh, I leave it to you, Dr. Nekuma. Thank you very much, Craig. <clears throat> and I just wish to say pleasant good evening, good morning, and good night to <laughs> all. And um, it is a pleasure to be here. And I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to share on this occasion and um, to meet all of you. Thank you very much. I'll begin to share my screen right away because I know that we have a lot to cover. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. So I'm starting at the wrong end. Let me get up to the top. And, um, okay, um, what I'm about to do today is to provide an overview of breadfruit trends in the Caribbean. And I've chosen to look at it just over the last decade. And for me, this is a pleasant experience because it has been, in my view, a decade of acceptance and recognition. I propose to look at the trends in five areas, consumer acceptance, processing, production, commercialization, research, development, outreach, and recognition. <clears throat> First of all, we want to look at consumer acceptance. In this area, 
there has been an apparent increase in consumer acceptance of the breadfruit as a food crop. And I say this because in spite of breadfruit being in the Caribbean for over 200 years, it has long been plagued by consumer rejection, which was the initial, uh, the initial reaction to what was a strange crop that had been introduced for people of African descent who were completely unfamiliar with this, what they called foreigner. So over the years, breadfruit has had a very much checkered relationship with consumers, um, being primarily important during times of hardship. And I think that that has always added to the stigma attached to it. But we see now a uh, change over the last few decades, and that seems to have um, increased over the last decades. Why are we saying that there has been an apparent increase? If we look at the products that are available from breadfruit, before only fresh the fresh breadfruit um, was available. Now we see products, the main ones being breadfruit flour and chips. And there is increased availability at the supermarkets. And we are also seeing some new products. There are several promotional activities. In St. Vincent, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, where the breadfruit festival started, precisely to address the issue of the sick stigma. Um, breadfruit festivals have been held annually. I know that COVID would have caused some disruption, but other countries in the region have taken up the breadfruit festival so that they are now a part of the food um, calendar in most of these countries. There's also been the heritage festivals and other food events. One of the things that has emerged uh, that is a clear indication of acceptance is the interest in the nutritional value of this food, not only as a food that is gluten-free, which really is probably more of a North American concern, but I think for us in the Caribbean, what is of concern, first of all, it is being embraced as a traditional crop, as part of our identity, and secondly, the fact that it is being grown in the tropics, it is, you know, it, it thrives in, in profusion in our countries. Um, it has been embraced. And then it is recognized that many of our dietary problems can be addressed through um, consumptions of food, consumption of foods like the breadfruit. Um, we are seeing acceptance there. And a number of young people are engaged in looking at new ways of preparing breadfruit and even converting some of the old ways into um, very interesting, um, very interesting presentations for which a market is growing. And some of these are um, showcased on videos on YouTube and so on. Recipe books have also been prepared. At least three have been published since um, 2015, you know, on the breadfruit. So that here, we can see on this slide, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they celebrate their breadfruit festival beginning August 1st. The month of August is dedicated to these festivals in St. Vincent. You can have up to four on the island within the month of August. And um, the biggest center is at the North Leeward in Chateau Belair, but um, they ha also have it linked with their tourism trust. As this slide indicates, breadfruit was not always this popular, all right? It was, this was not always the case, but today a number of products that have grown out of community efforts to develop the breadfruit, these products are now on the market. In Trinidad and Tobago, which was the place that probably had one of the strongest um, expressions of the stigma against breadfruit, now there is an annual avocado and breadfruit festival. 
uh, the University of the West Indies held the first breadfruit festival actually in Trinidad and Tobago. And you can see a chef very um, pleased to present not only her products, but a book that she published with breadfruit recipes. Jamaica is another place where there is a very strong um, representation and um, you know a traditional a traditional role for breadfruit in the diet, particularly um, in rural areas, but it is something that one would find throughout the Jamaican society. There is a very strong appreciation for breadfruit. And St. Mary's is an area that is associated with breadfruit production. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Daly will tell you a bit more. I believe he's from St. Mary's in, in Jamaica. And what we have seen is that Jamaica has taken the step of recognizing it as a heritage food. And in 2018, the Institute of Jamaica held a heritage festival to showcase the breadfruit. It was, the theme was from Captain Bly to roast and fry. So a number of schools were involved in that um, activity as well. And it was quite an educational experience. I want to just highlight as I said before, the involvement of young people. This is why I, I, it is very important that we understand this shift in consumer acceptance. Here we have two young people in Barbados. They're from Barbados. And they had a company, they founded a company called Strong Foods. And it is amazing that they took the roasted breadfruit, which was the first form of preparation, the first method of preparation of breadfruit in the Caribbean, in both St. Vincent and Jamaica, it remains the preferred way of preparing the breadfruit. But for a lot of other people, they shy away from that roasted breadfruit traditionally because, you know, out on the, the outside of the um, fruit was all charred and burnt and all of this. They have developed a product in which they are using the breadfruit, the roasted breadfruit as a bowl, and they are adding various fillings to it. And it is amazing how well received it is in the Barbadian society. So today, one can go to the supermarket and you can have fresh um, breadfruit purchased at your supermarket. You can also go to the shelves and purchase breadfruit flour. And as I said, just in case you are in doubt as to how to prepare the fresh breadfruit or the flowers, you can go to YouTube and you can find videos on preparation of things like roasted breadfruit, which is a traditional one. And, you know, not many persons might be quite familiar with it if it is not part of their tradition and new ways of preparing breadfruit. Like for example, we have a breadfruit and pigeon peas, which is a one pot invention by one of our young chefs in Trinidad. In the field of processing, there's a, again, increasing interest and a number of, of, of processors in of breadfruit, that number is increasing. The, the processors include farmers groups, community groups, small-scale individuals, large-scale processors, and even government agencies are involved in, to various extents throughout the region. The target markets, particularly for the farmers group, community groups, and most of the small-scale individuals is the domestic market. But we do have some small individuals who have also been focusing on the, the export market so that they would sell to the, to the local market and also to the export market. And even among the large scale processors, what we have seen is that they would first test market on the domestic market and based on their response, then you see they would start to push the product um, internationally. And so we have products that come to us in Trinidad from Jamaica, and some of these products are also sold um, in the US and in the UK and elsewhere.
government agencies who have focused on, for example, the full school feeding program, they have also been instrumental in promoting the development of breadfruit processing. One of the constraints that has manifested is the logistics of accessing supplies. And um, processors have responded to that in several ways. For example, some of them have gone into their own production. Others have forged contractual arrangements with farmers in their areas. Uh, some, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, I know one processor who imports from elsewhere in the region. And one large processor has even shifted operations to another country where the supply of the um, breadfruit is cheaper and the producers bring the breadfruit to the factory instead of the, the processors having to go out to look for the, um, to look for the breadfruit. So that, as I said, different strategies and different um, approaches being used to facilitate the processing activity. Most of the product mm -hmm. in the region, the processed product is um, consists of flour and chips. And I think this basically every country in the Caribbean that is processing breadfruit would process these two items. This one is from Barbados, breadfruit flour in green, the Carmita brand, and it is available um, at the airport. So that as you leave the, the um, airport there, you can, you can pick up a pack. And so we also have from, um, you know, Grenada, St. Vincent, and chips from very many of the various countries um, including Dominica, you know, some of these are long-standing operations. We have seen some new products such as wines and liqueurs. I recently saw a vodka coming out of the <clears throat> Virgin Islands and um, you just have new products being um, manufactured every day. So for example, <clears throat> if I'm sorry, I need to go back there a little bit. Um, this, this, this chip is out of Puerto Rico by Wanderan. Wanderan, uh, the, the owner, came to the conference in 2015 and on his return, he established this company and they apparently are doing quite well in Puerto Rico. A new product produced by uh, Jamaica producers whose brand is St. Mary's is Breadfruit Tostones. And they are marketing this, not only locally in Jamaica, but also throughout Latin America and the US. Okay. <clears throat> so production, what has happened in the area of production? As elsewhere, for example, in the Pacific, and, has, and, and, and as it has been traditionally, most breadfruit is produced in, um, in, in, in abandoned areas on old estates where it was intercropped with other crops such as cocoa and bananas and so on, or on small farmers fields where there may be just one or two trees, as well as in residential lots, in home backyards. At first we had, I would say during the 80s, 90s and so on, we had a decline in production because most of the trees were old. However, what we have seen since the beginning of the, um, this century is that there has been an uptick in production, a lot of it stimulated by government effort. But what we have seen <coughs> in the last decade is a continuation of this trend in establishing new plantings. And that has been done to meet uh, public sector processing demand as well as the demand for export. The main um, initiators of these new plantings, as I mentioned before, private processors, some of whom have taken to establishing their own orchards, 
uh, the Trees That Feed Foundation, they started introducing breadfruit plants in 2009, and they have continued that effort you know, until fairly recently in several countries in the region. And coming out of the International Breadfruit Conference, to which Craig referred, um, a lot of the um, persons who attended from the region, many of whom were part of farmers' organizations, they were able to contact um, Global Breadfruit, that is a supplier of tissue culture breadfruit material out of the US, and some of them were able to get um, free material um, from, from, from that source, um, as well as in Trinidad and Tobago, there was a philanthropist who was behind a lot of this free material that has gone from global breadfruit to other parts of the Caribbean and probably even elsewhere in the world. Um, he also sponsored the um, purchase of plants from the government ministry to give out to farmers in Trinidad and Tobago. What has become of these plants? Most of these plants have been established in um, either, <clears throat> either pure stand orchards, as you would see here, this particular one was established as an eight acre orchard, and it was established in response to a government initiative to supply local produce to the school feeding program. And so a processing company was established and this orchard was um, planted to supply breadfruit to that processing company. In Tobago, we have seen the, the Tobago House of Assembly also importing breadfruit and establishing in mixed stands with banana and other tree crops. In Dominica, they have been beneficiaries of some of the new introductions and they have been planting, you know, in between forest species and so on. Now, I must say that what has happened there is that uh, with the hurricane that we had recently, a lot of that planting in Dominica has been um, disrupted and some of the trees, you know, have been destroyed so that they have to do some starting over. The commercialization thrust is also increasing, it has accelerated. There are a number of government-led initiatives to improve food and nutrition security. For example, in St. Kitts and Nevis, the government took the bold step of, of, of actually um, deciding that they wanted to have a breadfruit and bread nut industry. And so these crops were written into their agricultural policy. There was a similar interest in Guyana and both government sought the assistance of the FAO through technical cooperation projects to have training for various um, activities to kickstart this industry, primarily in the areas of propagation, and also orchard establishment. In Guyana, there was also the interest in, you know, identifying where the industry was and um, um, what planting material they had, what, what, what um, germplasm they had and what they would need. We also had community-led initiatives, for example, the Jeffrey Tong Farmers Association. Um, they have been deeply involved in a school feeding program in their basic schools. These are children in the, you know, the early childhood schools. And um, they have been processing their porridge and their breadfruit, making it into a flour, and then um, processing that further into a porridge that uh, can be fed to the children. The North Leewa Tourism Association, they are very much interested in um, using the breadfruit that surrounds those northern villages um, in St. Vincent, particularly on the leeward side, uh, to stimulate the tourism industry through the um, promotion of breadfruit related activities that can enhance livelihood in that part of the country. And I know that they have been very active in getting funding to bring in um, processing equipment and so on. And there has also been an increased demand by food operators, hotels, and restaurants. So here we have some training taking place in St. Vincent, um, basically training in, in um, identifying breadfruit cultivars. And um, here we have um, some training in orchard establishment. 
in Guyana, we looked at the um, best areas for breadfruit cultivation. A survey was done there to see what was the status of the breadfruit. And to the extent that they were interested in expanding production, we were looking at um, some of the issues they have in making choices for um, suitable locations for that expansion. Finally, we would look at research, training, outreach, and recognition. The University of the West Indies has really been at the, I would say, has taken the lead in, as an institution in supporting breadfruit activity. And over the last decade, it has increased that support. Its research activities um, have increased and so have the publications that have um, um, come forth from that research. We have been training both at the postgraduate and undergraduate level. We have also provided training in collaboration with governments and the FAO. There have been very strong outreach activities through our participation in festivals and local events. And, you know, we have always set up a booth with educational materials. Uh, we have also been involved, for example, Dr. Grandison and I, we have been off to places like Tobago and so, you know, doing product testing. Uh, Craig spoke about the International Breadfruit Conference, which was basically um, done to promote commercialization of breadfruit for food and nutrition security through information sharing and updating the information that we all have and, you know, making contacts. And I believe that's why we are together today in this webinar. And um, the, food and fa the Faculty of Food and Agriculture even has a, in its main building a mural of its research activities in which breadfruit is represented. This is not just at the St. Augustine level, this level of support. Uh, I believe it really permeates the university. We also have cooperation from the KFL campus in Barbados. And even at the level of the regional headquarters, we have seen the breadfruit take um, front power position on the university's magazine and recently the, uh, the, the, the vice chancellor has participated with the faculty of medicine and myself in doing a short film on neglected and underutilized species in which the breadfruit is, has been highlighted. So here we have the breadfruit collection, just a small um, shot of it because that forms the basis of our research and outreach activities um, here. Um, we see breadfruit chips being prepared for World Food Day. Um, throughout this decade, we have used that as our World Food Day food. And um, we have the cover of the Pelican magazine on which it's represented. This is a shot of participants at the International Breadfruit Conference. And here we have a chef from the Hilton Hotel uh, doing a demonstration of um, breadfruit dishes for participants at the breadfruit festival that we held during the conference. So these are some of the publications that we have produced over the period, um, proceedings from the conference, a book that I did on the breadfruit collection, uh, manuals that were prepared on propagation and orchard establishment with the assistance of the FAO um, you can see some of our research posters here stepped, um, mounted at a festival in Jamaica. And we have also produced fact sheets that we have shared at the various festivals. So essentially my reflection on the trends in breadfruit and where breadfruit is likely to go uh, post this decade and into the future is that we have had two circumstances that I believe will increase production and consumption in the medium to long term. And those, those drivers are COVID-19, which has certainly exacerbated our food and nutrition security or I should, security situation, or I should say insecurity situation. It has made it quite stark. And of course, the threat of climate change um, and what that does in terms of our food imports and the need for us to 
um, pay much more attention to food production and increased consumption of the foods that we produce in the region. I have here a little um, WhatsApp message that was sent out from the Trinidad and Tobago Farmers and Home Gardeners Association. And what they are advertising is their breadfruit plants. Earlier, the yellow breadfruit plants at $60 per plant. That's twice the price that the plants are sold for at the ministry. So I think that this <laughs> indicates, you know, that um, breadfruit <laughs> is being recognized as a crop for the future in the region. Thank you very, very much. And as again, I want to thank um, the organizing team of Breadfruit People and also the Coalition of Farmers, the Farmers Organization um, under the ACP arrangement. I would want to thank them for this webinar and all of those in this series. I recognize the contribution of the organizations and many of the persons who have provided information on their activities, which I was able to mention in the presentation. And of course, the sterling support of the University of the West Indies for more than 30 decades um, has been invaluable and none of this would have been possible without that support. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nekrama. That was uh, wonderful and um, such a deep and um, deep overview of what, what's <laughs> happening from your perspective. So thank you. Um, every, I say this in seriousness. Every time I hear you speak, I think, I want to be more like her when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, maybe a so little bit. My apologies, Craig. I think I... Um, I did go over my time. I oh. kept looking at you for a signal to stop. You know? oh, no <laughs> problem. I, I didn't. I didn't really didn't want to stop you. So thank you for for everything. I yeah. Really apologize about that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll we'll move to our next speaker then, uh, is Dr. Isabella Francis Granderson, who is a public health nutritionist at University of West Indies St. Augustine campus. And uh, uh, Dr. Granderson works in household food security and many areas related to nutrition and health, uh, including working on breadfruit. So we're very happy to have you here to speak about um, nutrition and health as it relates to breadfruit. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, good evening, presentation. Let me just make sure this is it. Okay, so good afternoon, good night, good morning. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be um, a part of this webinar um, today. Um, you know, it's this is this is my second meeting in the area of breadfruit, having to do a presentation looking at the nutritional aspect. And you know, I hope what I have put together here, I have sort of given an overview first of the health profile in the region followed by two areas of research that I have been involved with, with Professor Nkoma, as well as um, Dr. Daly. So the um, CARICOM countries comprise of 15, 15 countries, or as we will now know it as small island states. And when we look at the health profile in the region, as Many other countries, they have been experiencing that epidemiological transition from communicable to non-communicable diseases. And for us, it's, over, it's about four decades, right? And today, what we are seeing is not only the malnutrition that we once knew, but it is the double burden, which we now look at or refer to as overnutrition, overweight and obesity. This slide is just giving you an, um, an idea of the prevalence of overweight and obesity 
um, among 10 countries within the region. Um, and if you look at, you can see where we are. St. Kitts seems, um, seem to be leading at the top above 80% of the population being overweight. And then when you look at um, the figures for obesity um, in the country, again, it's in kids followed by the Bahamas and so on. So the problem is not unique to any specific country, but it is widespread throughout the region. When we look at the, the broad groupings of conditions causing death in the Caribbean Caribbean countries, and you will see the red bars that you are seeing here represent non-communicable diseases. So this indicates that we are really in serious trouble. With regard to Trinidad and Tobago, um, a 2012 Pan American Stepwise Chronic Non-Communicable Diseases Prevalence and Risk Factor Survey indicated that for the individuals between ages 15 to 64 years, Right, 55 or 56 percent of the population um, between the ages of 15 and 64 were found to be overweight or obese. 34 percent females overweight, with 32 percent being obese. Men, 40 percent overweight, and 19 percent were found to be clinically obese. And we are seeing there's this increase by age 24 and over, whereby the this situation is really um, becoming um, a threat um, to the region. Um, when you compare Trinidad and Tobago with the other countries, you're also seeing that we have the highest prevalence as well as high morbidity and mortality rate for chronic non-communicable diseases in the region. With the leading cause of death, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and cerebrovascular disease. What are the causes? Common behavioral modifiable factors has been um, identified as smoking, physical inactivity, alcohol, the consumption of alcoholic beverages, and an unhealthy diet. When we look at the amount of the average energy being consumed um, over the period 2000 to 2013 for energy, we are seeing that we are way above 2,500 when we should be at 20, 2,200 on, on average. For protein intake, you're also seeing the average individual should be consuming about 56 grams of protein. Where are we? We are way above going close to 80 grams per day. And similar with fat. Our fat intake also speaks a lot. And above this line going across, you're seeing that 80 and above 80. So that these figures are really telling us where we are and also what should be done. So the major health related challenge or challenges that the, that carry, that the CARICOM region have been faced with is overweight and obesity. And as we know, obesity is a high risk factor for NCDs, where it costs CARICOM between five to 8% of the GDP. Among young women, we are seeing the figures rising, as well as among children. Right. Um, the prevalence of adult onset diabetes, including hypertension, we are now seeing those levels being increased among children as well. So that obesity is also linked with the low consumption of fruits and vegetables, high intakes of fat, oils, and sugar as well as personal choices and lifestyle. And not forgetting the institutional and market constraints on the domestic production of nutritious food. Oftentimes, the ultra-processed foods outweigh the nutritious foods. So what has been done so far and how are we really addressing 
this double burden. In 2007, the CARICOM heads of government met and they signed a declaration uniting to stop the pandemic or the epidemic, sorry, on chronic non-communicable diseases. 10 years later, they renewed their commitment so that there are a number of initiatives in place now in every country within the region as to how you know they are going about addressing the problem. But what we know thus far, when you look at the chronic non-communicable diseases, when you look at what literature is showing with regard to the relationship or the association, we know that food matters. Food play a major role in these with these conditions. And now the trust is towards more of a plant-based diet, right? One that is rich in complex carbohydrates, cereals, provision, grains, vegetables, with moderate protein and fat intake. Okay. And here's where I see breadfruit has a role. Right. What role can breadfruit play with regard to? addressing some of the problems we are faced with with non-communicable diseases. In the literature, you would see breadfruit is being recognized as a superfood, right? It is also being recognized as a functional food. And to me, when I was going around, you know, thinking about putting together the presentation, I said, but wait a minute. Breadfruit really is a sustainable as well as any environmentally healthy option and one in which can make some difference. So all the literature tells you when you read about breadfruit, it's a very good source of carbohydrates. It contains several minerals and vitamins, complete amino acid profile, Okay, and some work that was carried out by my um, oral or colleague who will be presenting um, shortly, Prof and myself and some other researchers. Um, one of the key things with breadfruit is the high dietary fiber and resistant starch content that it contains. And it makes breadfruit a unique um, product in that when it is compared with other root crops or even some cereals, the resistant starch content is a whole lot lower. So that in a study assessment of breadfruit, one second, cultivars for resistant starch, dietary fiber and energy density, carried out by oral, um, Prof, Prof and Kumar and myself and some other researchers, we found that among the 14 different cultivars assessed, resistant starch was found to be high in all the cultivars, ranging from 42.35 grams to 50 grams, with an overall mean of 46.03 grams per 100 grams. Right? The difference between the resistant starch content among the cultivars were highly significant. So that the Mahafala cultivar was found to have the highest level of resistant starch. Now these findings do support other research and it also indicates that dietary fiber, including resistant starch, play a role, a key role in the transit and digestion time of food through the digestive system as fiber increases the time required for digestion of food after consumption. And when this is compared with non-resistant starch, you will see then that digestion, um, the food is able to be digested a whole lot quicker or immediately as compared to um, a food like breadfruit with that high level of resistant starch. So that it in the increased time required for digestion of food rich in dietary fiber and resistant starch has the potential to increase 
the period of satiety, meaning it makes one feel full of faster. And this may help to improve metabolic control that is associated with type 2 diabetes and aid in weight management. The study also found that approximately 53 grams of uncooked breadfruit flour, which is equivalent to about 160 grams of edible breadfruit pulp, would satisfy the RDAs or the recommended dietary allowance of 30 grams of dietary fiber, which is inclusive of resistant starch. So it is telling you that you don't need to eat a lot of food to meet the fiber requirement, the dietary fiber requirements as recommended. In addition, breadfruit is considered a low to moderate food on the glycemic index. What does this mean? It is used as a gauge, right? As to how much of food impacts blood glucose when eaten alone. So that it plays a role in the management of diabetes in keeping, you know, that slow control. It contains small amounts of polyunsaturated fat, which is known to lower right, the LDLs or the bad cholesterol, and it reduces the risk of heart disease. It also provides quality protein and especially essential amino acids, leucine and lysine, right, which we need on a daily basis. And just this one particular fruit can provide all of these valuable nutrients. Again, the range of vitamins and minerals that you can get from breadfruit, especially vitamin A, it supports eye health and more so for celiac disease in the provision of gluten-free gluten -free diet. So that given the nutritive value and the properties that breadfruit have, it can be a game changer in the dietary management of type 2 diabetes, obesity, and non-related communicable diseases. Now, taking into consideration what is also taking place with our school-aged children, because we are seeing the rise with overweight and obesity among that age group, and then the snacks that are served at the schools are really not complementary in the, in, to the point that it is also affecting their health as well. So we decided to look at a study where we uh, did the assessment of sensory characteristics and acceptability of breadfruit flour in quick and yeast bread. Again, um, we partnered with uh, Professor Enkroma, um, one of our students, worked on the project with us, and we had another uh, lecturer with us who is no longer with us, unfortunately. So then the aim of that study was to investigate the sensory properties of breadfruit flour of three different cultivars in the formulation of three types of quick and yeast breads. Right, the three, um, Breadfruit cultivars was utilized in the formulation of muffins, buns, and we did a pizza base. We worked with blends of 15, 25, and 35% for muffins, and 25, 35, and 45 for the buns and the pizza, and our control was 100% wheat. Our findings is that the most acceptable breadfruit flour blend was our of a low, Lola at 15% and 25% respectively. With regard to the sensory evaluation, we targeted school-aged children and the feedback we got, 85% of the respondents rang the muffin as super good, 50% rang the pizza as really good, and they were not very pleased with the bun. 49 or 42 or 43% of the respondents ranked the bun as bad. 
So some more work is needed there to get it to the point whereby it could be a lot more acceptable for that age group. When we worked it with, the, with older adults, um, they, it was accepted. So what are the implications with regard to our health profile and the role that bread food can play? We see that it is useful to inform consumers about the potential uses of bread fruit flour as a high fiber carbohydrate in baked products. Bread fruit can be considered as a potential meal item for the school feeding program, and they have started doing some work in that area. Dietitians and nutritionists can educate their clients about the added benefits of supplementing wheat flour and other products with bread fruit flour, thus increasing the nutritive value as well as the fiber content. And I would just like to conclude with thank you for the opportunity again um, for the Breadfruit People Network for inviting me to participate, the University of the West Indies for the funds provided to assist us with the research activities that we have done, and for all the other um, individuals. My, some of my slides were taken from the Caribbean Public Health Agency, and on that note, thank you. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Granderson, for that very interesting um, presentation. I learned a lot, um, and it, it made me hungry for breadfruit. <laughs> oh, oh, look. Here's some breadfruit that Auntie Shirley brought. <laughs> I will snack on this later. Um, okay. <laughs> So uh, for, for our next presentation, um, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Judy Rouse Miller, who is a lecturer in botany at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine. And um, she began her interest in breadfruit propagation in the 1990s. And she also received an award for her pioneering work in breadfruit propagation at the 2015 um, International Breadfruit Conference. So with that, I uh, would love you to begin, um, Dr. Ross Miller. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. I will begin sharing. Right, good afternoon again. So this evening I'm presenting on propagation and what is happening in the region. By way of introduction, um, breadfruit, as we all know, is most of the cultivars are seedless. And if seeded, um, the seed is unorthodox or recalcitrant, and therefore alternative propagation methods other than seed propagation is of necessity. So um, natural regeneration, uh, was observed in terms of adventitious shoots or suckers formed on damaged roots. And these rooted adventitious shoots uh -huh. can be removed and transplanted. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so this has been, um, over 200 or years or more, this is how the movement of breadfruit 
occurred from West Pacific to East Pacific, and even from the Pacific to the Caribbean. These adventitious shoots were rooted and transplanted, spotted and traveled wherever business went. In the Caribbean, the main propagation method is still the use of root cuttings, but with um, some modification. So I've outlined here the map of propagation. The root cuttings would be now excised from the root system of mature trees and placed in either sand, in sand and propagating bins under shade and regular irrigation. This facilitates um, production of numerous adventitious shoots on the root cuttings. And from these, stem cuttings are removed and they are subsequently rooted again in the shade with good irrigation. And these are the, these um, rooted stem cuttings are then hardened and sold primarily by the government ministries and by few private groups. The, this information or this technique of, of propagation using the root cuttings and the propagation or the use of the stem cuttings from these adventitious shoots have been shared with the Caribbean. And uh, most of our Caribbean islands now know how to use this technique for propagation. Air layering in the field or in greenhouses is also um, possible or is practiced as well. In vitro culture from a shoot tip, um, from mature plants, and therefore the micropropagation using solid or liquid system has also been achieved in the Caribbean. Now, it is not done commercially in the Caribbean, but we do have the um, knowledge, technical knowledge to carry out the in vitro propagation of the We also have breadfruit planting material imported into the Caribbean and Dr. Roberts did touch on this. The distribution of breadfruit trees by the Trees of Free Foundation. They include directly with NGOs and government ministries, and they have worked with a number of countries in the Caribbean region. The micropropagated plants which are used are usually sourced from commercial tissue culture labs in the US and uh, transported to um, the countries. Um, I have here a few countries that I was able to find the information for. These trees have been distributed to Haiti, Barbados, Bahamas, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico, just to mention a few in our specific region. I just want to focus briefly on the, what we have done in the Caribbean with regard to breadfruit propagation, in vitro propagation. The, all the stages I have represented here from stage one to zero, we were able to do this um, production at the Biotechnology Unit of the Department of Life Sciences. And uh, of the stage zero would be the mature plant, or it can also be the adventitious shoots, which are formed on root cuttings. Establishment. This is a little marker the establishment stage here. And then the liquid culture system was very effective in very quickly producing a large number of shoots, which can then be rooted and subsequently hard. So this process was, this particular technique was done for the Marfalo cultivar, and as well as our yellow flesh cultivar. There's also the potential for merging 
the in vitro regeneration with macrophagation. So you were able to graft more follow micro shoots produced in vitro onto the shutine or the bread nut seedlings. The benefit of this perhaps would be knowing that the seeded bread nut has a deep root system and uh, the adventitious nature of the breadfruit root system um, lends itself to maybe susceptible to water logging and diver. And this grafting of the breadfruit then onto the shutine would have the benefit of um, the deep rooted system for the plant. And so it also may reduce the loss of material trees during heavy winds. We know that this has been a problem quite recently in the Bahamas and also in Vincent. We have had um, loss of large trees due to approach. Another way in which I see the in vitro technology working would be for rapid propagation of planting material. Um, now that we are aware of the, or have evaluated a number of cultivars in terms of what um, particular varieties are adequate for processing of different um, products, then some uh, persons may want to invest more in a particular cultivar. In which case, and these may not be the traditional cultivars, not the yellow, not the marfot, but other cultivars which may have some um, potential for particular processing need. And therefore, these can be rapidly um, propagated. So, introduction of um, material for establishment of new cultures. Be, it will also be beneficial to use this technique in microbiology. Conservation, uh, most of the cultivars are now conserved either in site or field collections, and therefore an in vitro backup from um, the So with that, I thank you for inviting me to present today very briefly on propagation as it has been happening in the Caribbean. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, on, uh, for that introduction. Uh, very interesting. And uh, thank you for all your work in that area. Um, I realize, I realize that we are we're running a little bit late. Um, we will we will uh, of course uh, have allow time for all of our presenters to present. I'll remind you everyone um, to put your questions in the Q and A box as they pop into your mind, and that will allow our presenters to um, to respond to those questions in text form in the Q and A box. Um, and also rem remind our panelists also uh, to, to look in the Q&A box for questions that are directed towards them. Yes, you do that, thanks. And um, so we'll go to our next speaker, Dr. Oral Daly. He is a researcher and educator in agricultural production, food and quality management and, educa and education. Um, he is based at the, again, the University of West Indies, St. Augustine, and he will uh, talk with us about breadfruit varieties in the Caribbean, his research in that area. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here at this time. Allow me to do my presentation.
Mm. So greetings again, everyone. And Greg, once again, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's truly a pleasure to be for dialoguing with you, but also to be here with my colleagues. I do value this opportunity. So this presentation is going to be on breadfruit cultivars in the Caribbean. And just a quick outline, I want to talk a little about the introduction of breadfruit to the Caribbean. That's very relevant to our cultivars and the, the, the knowledge we have about cultivar distribution in the region. We'll talk about breadfruit vernacular, breadfruit cultivar or vernacular names in the region, morphological diversity. Just the second. And just bear with me a second, Craig. I, there is. Okay. I think, I think I'm much better now. Right, so we want to talk about breadfruit cultivar or vernacular names in the Caribbean, the morphological diversity in the region. I want to touch a little on consumer preference and utilization with respect to, to cultivars. Then I'll, I just want to talk about other measures of cultivar diversity. And finally, a little of the work on breadfruit germplasm and conservation here at the University of West Indies. So without any further ado, let me go straight into right breadfruit introduction to the Caribbean. So on the first ill-fated voyage, Captain Bly was informed by the inhabitants of Tahiti that they have eight varieties of breadfruit. We know that he didn't make it to the region with, with, with what was collected because of the mutiny. But in the successful voyage in 1793, he was able to distribute breadfruit to St. Vincent and Jamaica. He did not really tell us the names of those varieties that was introduced in 1793, but most plants collected from this, most plants were collected from the same location um, where he had collected in 1789. One seeded type and one unnamed seedless variety was also collected from Timor. He recorded having five types before reaching St. Helena. That's so when, while he was on his voyage, he recorded that. Of course, again, the names weren't given. And the curator of the St. Vincent Botanic Garden, shortly after receiving the plants from Captain Blair when he delivered them, described six varieties of breadfruit in the Botanic Garden. And this is the information that really forms the basis of breadfruit cultivar and diversity in the region. And as you heard, previous speakers spoke about these varieties, except for the Chatain, which we now know as Chatain. You know, in, in the early literature, we talk about seeded breadfruit, but now we, we know very clearly that we're actually talking about Chatain or bread nut. So all the other breadfruit varieties are the true breadfruit that we're really focusing on here today are actually seedless, and we know that. Um, I'm not sure what's happening, Craig, but I do have some problems with changing my slides. Okay. So, compounding with the fact that Bly did not really provide us with any name, or no name were, were given, And although we are estimating that, you know, based on where we collected, it's somewhere between eight and five varieties based on the information received. We also recognize in the region that there are a lot of cultivar or even vernacular names identified um, in different countries. So in a study that was done, we came across 44 cultivar or vernacular names throughout the region. And as you can see here, the highest number was found in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 23 names. In Jamaica, we have 15 names. In Trinidad, there were just two names. And of course, in Tulio, six names. And it is certainly understood why we would have 
you know, those high numbers for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Jamaica. In fact, those were the two locations that Bert Woodward was introduced directly. But I mean, that really doesn't make the story any easier, but certainly gives us some interesting information on which to work with. When we look at morphological variation, we see morphological variation in terms of fruit, in terms of leaves, and in some, in some cases, even tree architecture. You look at this slide, I just have six fruit um, from six named cultivars. And you can see that there are differences in shape. You can see that there are differences in size. But very, very important is also the texture or the feel of the fruit. You know, we talk about the skin being smooth or it being rough. You know, that's a very, very important feature. And in other studies that we, we looked at, we recognize that that feature, you know, skin, skin feel, whether it is rough or smooth, is also associated with, 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 with other parameters, other genetic parameters of breadfruit. So while I'm not going to be presenting that this afternoon, you know, the, this whole business of skin feel is very, very important. But the other features, um, you know, fruit size, fruit color, and so on, those are also very, very necessary. And in fact, um, as I talk to you about some of the varieties in the next couple of slides, I will be sharing a, a bit more information about those. Um, here you're only seeing the outer portion of the fruit, but you know, there are also differences in terms of flesh color. Um, we also did study looking at um, flesh texture. Other studies talk about mouth feel and so on, and, and, and there, there are cultivar differences in all these parameters. And I will want to mention some of that before I wrap up this afternoon. So that's it for morphological variation among Caribbean breadfruit cultivars. We also have quite a diversity when we look at the leaves. Here you have you're looking at seven leaves from you know seven cultivars, named Caribbean cultivars. And you can see that we're ranging from an almost entire leaf, a variety we call Timor. Very popular in Jamaica, but very, very interestingly, we don't see this a lot in other countries of the region. Then we have a variety, cassava, and if you look at cassava, it is distinct in the sense that you actually have very deep sinuses. And in fact, the lobes are sometimes, you, you know, lobed again. So you, you, you can have lobe on more than one level in this variety or this cultivar that we refer to as cassava. And between that, we can, all, we can see other variation. For example, the kasha bread represented, represented here on this slide as a well. You can see you know, the color differences and, and the wrinkliness of the, um, the leaf as compared to, 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 to B, which we, we refer to as Waterloo. So there's quite a variation in the, morpholo the morphology of breadfruit leaf as we go in different countries and as we look at different varieties. So let's talk a little about some of the more common varieties, uh, uh, you know, based on the names that we, we, we have, because certainly I wouldn't be able to share with you the 44 names that we, 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 we came across. So what we, we do have some of the more popular names and those are what I want to share with you right now. So we, for example, the yellow or yellow art, and you know, this is probably one of the most popular variety throughout the entire region. The flesh usually range from light yellow to um, you know, to an appreciable yellow, um, depending on stage of maturity. And as I, you know, later on, I'll talk a little more about consumer preference because this is certainly one of the varieties or cultivar that consumer tend to gravitate towards. The white or white heart. Um, Again, you know, the outward appearance is quite similar to that of yellow. The, the main difference is really in the, um, is in, in the color of the flesh. And consumers actually talk about having, feel, um, observing differences in eating quality. So that's very, very, you know, very, very important because sometimes it's difficult to, to distinguish white from yellow, but, you know, consumers make that distinction when it comes down to, to the eating quality. And that is something that we, 
we have really have to pay attention to. Kasha bread, a variety, quite popular in St. Vincent. Um, I don't know, produce pretty large fruits. Um, the skin tend to be very rough. In fact, that's, you know, that's actually related to the name Kasha, and that's why one of the reasons why, why it, it got that name because of the rough skin. Timo. This is the one I you know, mentioned earlier about having this almost completely noticed. You, know, you don't have any sinuses and lobas. It's quite popular with many of the other varieties. And, and this variety is you know, very, very common throughout Jamaica. But very interesting, as you go to different, different parts of Jamaica, you know, the name can vary. Sometimes you hear it being called Timo. Other places you hear it being called St. Kitts. And that actually complicates the issue of, of diversity sometimes because there's another variety that is this one, um, cassava. So um, here I'm referring to it as cassava or Captain Bly. The, 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 the Jamaican name is cassava breadfruit. But in St. Vincent, you go there and they will call it Captain Bly. You may even hear them referring to it as English, English man breadfruit or English breadfruit. Um, and of course, that is because of the association with, with Captain Bly, as this name would, would imply. But in Jamaica, sometimes this variety is also mistakenly called Timor. And you can see how that, you know, confuses the, the whole thing when you, when you think about um, the, 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 this one that I says, you know, you refer to as Timor or says Kits. So those are some of the breadfruit names. Maka, this, again, this is a name associated with Jamaica, um, very, very, very similar to cashew bread out of St. Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. Oak marble, uh, Vincentian, Vincentian variety. Now, I'm fearing my follower not because it is one of what we would consider to be our traditional Caribbean cultivar, but this is a cultivar that is gaining popularity in Trinidad, in fact, you know, I have heard people refer to this variety as a table bread fruit, maybe because of the, the size of the fruit. It, it, it really isn't as large as, uh, as the yellow or white, which we are very, very much accustomed to throughout the region. But it does have a very yellow flesh. And I, you know, as I said, <laughs> by now you pick up that consumers in the Caribbean do have a preference for, for, yellow, for yellow flesh or yellow varieties. Another feature of this Malfoyla is that the trees tend to be a little more compact. I, I wouldn't refer to it as, as being a dwarf tree in any way, but um, because uh, you know, I've seen it in some ones and, and so on, pretty, I think it's a pretty large tree. But that is also one of the, 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 the attraction to this variety, you know, that idea of having um, a dwarf variety. So I'm sharing it here because, again, it gaining, it's gaining a lot of popularity in Trinidad. Not so much true to all the other Caribbean countries. I know it was introduced in Jamaica as well, um, but I think in Trinidad that's where you see the greatest um, increase in terms of popularity. So that's it when we talk about the morphological features and some of the, the, the common varieties in the Caribbean. I want to just quickly talk about consumer preference and utilization. And clearly, consumer have preferences when it comes on to, to cultivars. And also, the, the preference that consumers have is dependent on the end use of the fruit. In Trinidad, um, consumers tend to you tend to, 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 to do more oil down. You know, that's that that's the dish, that's a popular dish um, for breadfruit preparation in Trinidad. And of course, again, they would prefer to use um, the yellow varieties in things like wheat. Um, roasting in Jamaica and St. Vincent. So roasting is very popular in Jamaica and St. Vincent. Again, yellow is a very popular variety in that, in that respect. And you know, I've gone to, to even Tobago and hear people talking about yellow variety, referring to it as butter variety. That very, very soft and, and, and smooth texture is a very, very important feature that consumer look for. All right, so this is just a picture showing you roasting of breadfruit, as I say, quite popular in Jamaica and St. Vincent. And here you can see it being served 
Um, first out of Jamaica, breadfruits being served with ackee and saltfish in the bottom right picture. Um, very tasty dish. There are some other measures of cultivar diversity, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail because of time, but for those of you who will be viewing this presentation at a later, at a later time, I've placed all the, the references at the end of the presentation. So I do invite you to, um, you know, to, to, to go in and to, to read those references. But in terms of nutritional and physical chemical um, diversity, Grooms et al. looked at the start and, and the flow of different breadfruit varieties here in Trinidad. So you know, that's, a, that's, that's an important study you'd want to, um, to check. I know that a lot of people have an interest in flow so very, very interesting study there. And of course, there are, there are, there are differences in the nutritional parameters of the, the, the flowers um, for, among cultivars. This study, and I thank Dr. Dr. Grandis for really elaborating on it earlier, so I don't need to go into much detail here, but we do recognize that there are differences in resistance starch, dietary fiber, and energy density among cultivars. Dr. Grandis did point out that in our study, the Marfoila came out as, as having the highest level of resistant starch. Um, let me just add to, 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 to that, that our yellow variety, which is so well appreciated in the Caribbean, was not significantly different from the Marfoila. So while it wasn't, it didn't have as high level as the Marfoila, you know, it still had a very high level and was actually higher than, than, than the overall mean that was presented at 46 gram per 100 gram. We also looked at sensory and physical chemical analysis. And again, we saw that there were differences in, 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 text, um, in cultivar in terms of um, skin texture, um, pulp texture. We, you know, even, even in terms of the tensile strength, we use, we use a, a meter to, 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 um, to test um, the pulp of the breadfruit. And we, we saw that there are differences in cultivar. So, you know, it's very, very, um, Interesting, and I, again, I invite you to, to read on that. Um, Dr. Grandison, in her presentation, also spoke about product development. So, um, and where we look at different muffin and, and look at the use of different different types of flour to, to you know evaluating those things. In terms of propagation and orchard management, grafting, we you you know different cultivars assigned material at different response time. And this was some work done by Solomon Jr. et al. Um, with, 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 with Robert and Kuma and Rose Miller. Again, um, the reference is provided. So I invite you to look at it. Tissue culture work, Dr. Miller already um, you know, expounded on that. So I appreciate that again, there are differences in, in our cultivar response. Root, Cuttings and adventitious fruit production, Robert and Kumo also demonstrated in a, in a study that different cultivars responded differently. And in a study looking at incidence of fruit rot, Robert and Kumo and Daly also showed that the way different food, the susceptibility of different food to um, incidence of fruit rot are different, different pathogens is, you know, is, is, is quite variable. And so we have to think about those things when we're managing um, orchards with different cultivars. Germplasm conservation. The U.S. has one of the most diverse collection or germplasm collection outside of Oceania. In our collection, we have over 12 Caribbean accession and we have 22 recently introduced accession. And we are talking about accessions introduced from um, Hawaii, Samoa, Seychelles, and so on. And all of this is, you know, is important in supporting our research and commercialization effort in the region. Here are the references. And I just want to say thank you to the organizers and convener of this webinar. It's really a pleasure to be here. But I also want to thank my colleagues who presented before me, you know, there, I think they have been unselfish in their pursuit of research in the area of bird food. And that has really paved the way for people like me to really, to really get involved. And I must thank them for that. Um, you know, special thanks must be given to Professor Laura Roberts and Kuma, who I think has been a, a true visionary in the, you know, dedicating over 30 years of, of, of her effort 
in, in researching breadfruit. And I must acknowledge and applaud that effort and thank her very much. So with those few words, I really want to thank you once again for having me. And I look forward to your questions at the end of this, um, of all the presentations. Thanks, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daly, for that uh, beautiful presentation. Really, really uh, wonderful to see all of all of the work you've done, and and as you said, um, uh, uh, integrating the work of so many other people. And we were just commenting here in our little group um, just how much work uh, you all have been doing over over decades. That's it's so impressive, and. Um, you know, we've gone, we're, we're over time now. We have one more presenter. Um, and, uh, but I, I think that, you know, we, almost all of our participants are still with us. And uh, I think that attests to how fascinating um, and, and stimulating your, all the presentations have been. Um, so, but if you do have to leave um, uh, to attendees, uh, you 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 can do that. We won't feel bad if you have to leave. We realize this has gone long, and um, so I will mention that um, we will invite our, the presenters to share their presentations as PDF files, and those presenters who would wish to do that, uh, we will post those at the Breadfruit People website. Uh, again. The recording of this whole webinar will be available at, Breadfruit, at the Breadfruit People website. And so um, if you couldn't stay uh, for whatever reason, this will be uh, available later on. So we have one more uh, presentation that I'm very much looking forward to. This is a pre presentation by Adrian Kirtan, uh, who's a food industry professional, and he has over 30 years experience in food manufacturing, food service, and um, food environments. So um, he his work highlights innovation in the food sector. So without further ado, please uh, um, begin your presentation, Adrian. Good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. From here in Barbados, Thank you very much for Breadfruit People for inviting me and um, for my colleagues from in Trinidad for keeping me in touch of what's going on with Breadfruit. My presentation is short <laughs> to the point. So I'm talking about value added activities in the Caribbean. There were some references earlier on in my colleagues' presentations. So what you're going to see basically is uh, what's happening on the ground in Barbados itself. Before we talk value added, obviously we need to understand the market. And by understanding the market is about understanding consumers themselves and where breadfruit falls into that whole category. So I've listed some of what you might call the, the consumer drivers for the food industry relative to where breadfruit will fit in. And you have the whole issue of convenience. People want to, people live in a quick lifestyle. They want to do, they're doing things rather fast, rather quickly, time is limited. So convenience is very important for food products. Taste is very important. You know, people want something that, is full flavored and these days a lot more people are looking for something that a local and authentic experience when it comes to food and its taste critically to i mean even before the pandemic health and wellness was figuring big and bold as far as consumer choices when it comes to food and within the pandemic that that remains but also within the last two years, I would say the pandemic has influenced some situations where we are seeing trends from the consumer end. There's a lot more now coming back into the home. Food is being prepared in the home 
more regularly due to the restrictions, you know, that most countries and most populations would have endured. So home meal, homemade, home center is, is, is part and parcel of consumer um, desires. Societal care is also even showing its face more and more. You know, the, the environment and, and people and being able to do things that and be part of what is happening for the better good of the society. And also the, the, the pandemic has also influenced a situation where incomes have been negatively impacted. So obviously we are seeing things that where people affordability is high on people's mind and therefore people have to be are looking for food products that are meeting all the other touch points I would have mentioned but also it has to be affordable for their pocket. All right so from that point of view we're looking at um, breadfruit itself and uh, the type of products that have been made and are being produced from a Barbados perspective. And I could say uh, I was actually out in the trade today to really get a good feel because some of these things have been around for the last couple of years. So first up, we have the breadfruit flower, really uh, alternate flower to the wheat for people who are looking for gluten-free products. And definitely we have two main producers in, in Barbados and their product is on the shelf and it has been there for about the last five or more years and there's increasing usage with these bread breadfruit flour you know people are looking at either replacing a um, partial replacement of wheat flour or combining breadfruit flour as a glu gluten-free with other gluten-free products to make make um products that um they can easily consume you know partial replacement for breads or muffins or pancakes. There's a utilization of these flowers um, in those products. I think um, based on some of the feedback you hear from consumers, the issue might be the, the, um, the distinct flavor of breadfruit being retained in the flower itself. And obviously, sometimes depending on the type of product that, that you're making, that that flavor, that distinct flavor of breadfruit can come through. And therefore, you know, some people might want to balance out against that. But yes, where wheat flour has has been used traditionally, breadfruit flour is now being either fully or partially utilized to make products that the consumer can handle. Chips, snacking and convenience is real. And um, breadfruit chips are part and parcel of the, the consumer's experience here in Barbados. And there's this one company, nice packaging they have, very, you can't miss it on the shelf. And they, again, they've been doing that about uh, five years. And the product is good. You know, I have, if you might be able to see it, <laughs> I made sure I did a taste sample today. So very good product, very good um, consistency of the brand itself. And they, this company is also known for doing other local root crops and producing local, local authentic products themselves. So snacks are, are part and parcel of the whole thing. There is another new company in Barbados that's also doing snacks. It's called Yuhu, Yu, Yulu Foods, taking the name from um, the, the Pacific name for breadfruit. And they're also doing snacks. And um, they're branding them as um, tortilla chips style. And again, good taste, good, good flavor all, all together. This company, Yulu Foods, is been launched about just three months on the market. And uh, they're given that home milk style products. They have, um, I just took 
this was in the refrigerator section. They have um, pre-cut um, chips for the consumer that then you can take home and you can fry and accompany your meals. They've also, they also I don't have um, photos of them, but they also have sliced breadfruit that you can just pre-slice and pre-peel that you can take home again and just add to the pot. They also have tortilla, tortilla um, wraps that you can use. And, but these are a blend between um, breadfruit and cassava flour bases. But this company is, is really pushing the, the home meal type aspect of it and also the local and authentic use of product. And also with, from the convenience side, because you know your, your product is already peeled, is already cut, and therefore you as the person purchasing and the consumer, you have a, a minimum amount of um, activity to really prepare your meal all, all together. This is another company in Barbados. I think um, Dr. Ankurmer referred to them earlier. They are doing home style products. They have taken the traditional breadfruit itself and are offering it in a way that is really new and to the young population, the younger adults. And I think they have really taken off. And what they have done is actually roasted breadfruit, which is traditional here in Barbados and the Caribbean. But then they have cut the breadfruit in half and then they scoop out the contents and then they fill the content, fill back the, the, the emptied half with breadfruit plus whatever offerings that you would like. And they have a wide variety of offerings. All right, so you see on the left, you can have um, your salted fish with your vegetables and your breadfruit all mixed into a, a bread, what you call a breadfruit bowl. On the right, you have, um, if you into vegetarian style with your chickpeas and your curry and your other veg, you can also have that. And the, the environmental aspect of this is not lost because the, when at the end, it's just a roasted breadfruit skin that you can easily dispose of and there's no harm to the environment as it is. And these, this company is very innovative and I, and I really like what they're doing. So today I went out and I actually bought some of their uh, taco, taco shells from breadfruit. The shells are made from thinly sliced breadfruit and formed into a taco shell. And again, you get your filling. And again, very innovative and touching base with the younger um, generation and keeping the whole issue of breadfruit alive and continuing to be part and parcel of the culinary experience here in Barbados. All right, so that is it really for the type of value addition that has been going on. I would also want to share, I didn't have a picture, but I want to share this here. This is a breadfruit cracker. I don't know, you might not be able to see it too good. Um, about two and a half years ago, I was asked to develop a, a innovative product with breadfruit. So I, I came up with a, a cracker, a small a cracker product. It's handmade, but this is about 20% um, substitution of wheat flour. And uh, it had a very, very good response through the developmental agency. The challenge commercially with um, breadfruit flour and other gluten-free flours is that because of the lack of gluten, machinability is not something that is easy. And therefore, you would, you know, there's a need to manipulate formulas to be able to get a, a, a dough 
especially for working to produce products that the consumer would be familiar with, but it's not impossible. And I'm sure that uh, as there's more effort into the R&D side of utilizing breadfruit, we will be able to see more and more action to bring out products in that way. All right, so I want to thank again, the breadfruit people and my colleagues for inviting me to be part of this presentation. And I'm here to answer any questions or queries that anyone has. Thank you. Wow, um, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, you should have seen us three sitting here. There's Auntie Shirley again, pointing at the screen. Wow, uh, you guys have really, uh, that, that's so impressive and uh, creative. Thank so you. Thank, thank you so much for sharing those things with us. Um, if you have questions for Adrian, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we've come to the end of our presentations. And I know we've run long here, so we don't have time for um, in-person Q&A. Uh, but um, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will either get those answered now, live, uh, in the Q&A box, or later on presenters can um, respond offline. I would also like to invite at this point um, Kyle from Breadfruit People uh, to perhaps say a few words, perhaps Irene would like to speak just a little bit about Breadfruit People and then we will, then we will wrap. Uh, I just want to say thank you. What a, what an awesome uh, morning. So inspiring uh, to hear all of the uh, research and, uh, and practical development work that's happening in the Caribbean. And um, um, thank you for the time. And, and I hope that we can um, uh, share this work more widely. So if you um, receive an email from us, uh, either myself or Irene, we really appreciate uh, uh, the, the time that you can provide uh, to, to be able to, to share this. And, and similarly, you know, we hope to be able to uh, link up with um, you know, other researchers and producers in the Pacific so that uh, they can enhance the work that you guys are doing. And um, I'm just so excited. Um, uh, in parallel to this is a series on, on breadfruit product development. And so we, are, we just finished our third week. And, um, uh, you know, uh, as, we, as we saw, Adrian, uh, that there are so many innovators out there. And if we can just get them excited to channel some of that towards uh, breadfruit and and there's so many great researchers out there. And if we can continue to channel that towards breadfruit, um, you know, we, we're gonna we're gonna make a big impact. So so thank you guys so much for that. And uh, Craig and and Megan behind the scenes uh, pulling everybody together in this virtual age. And uh, of course, uh, all of the people uh, contributing with, um, with questions and comments. Um, you know, uh, it's just it's so exciting and uh, inspiring to be a part of this. And uh, we look forward to uh, collaborating more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. And again, it's just been a joy to work with you and your team, Irene and Elaine and the whole PFON team. Um, and uh, it's been really rewarding. Uh, I see that Laura um, signaled that she wanted to answer a question live. Do you still want to do that? Uh, You're, we can't hear you. Actually, that, that was not my choice. Okay. I saw it and I wondered, you know, why I didn't have the option to type the answer. Okay. But the answer actually is that I am not really sure. Most, most farmers in the Caribbean, at least registered farmers, are male. Um, but we would find that the actual... Um, ratio of male to female farmers would vary from country to country. So I can just give a straight answer on that one. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay thank you so much. And uh, one more note uh, next time, uh, which is in two weeks from today, 
our um, general webinar uh, in the same uh, time slot will be about breadfruit flower production. So we will have several speakers on breadfruit flower um, production from dehydration to milling and so forth. So um, everyone's welcome to, to join us then. And um, until then, I think we will say goodbye and thank you. Aloha. Thank